is a familiar aspect of moral experience, uh, but it's surprisingly unclear exactly what it involves. There you see the appeal and pitfalls of philosophy in a nutshell. Philosophy begins from common sense and proceeds to find it more puzzling, uh, perhaps, than, than, than other people would. Uh, accounts of blame tend toward two uh, ideas. The first is essentially evaluative. To blame someone is to form a negative evaluation of what that person's character is like. The second idea is punitive. Blame is a kind of sanction, a milder form of punishment. But neither of these interpretations seems to me to fit the facts of our moral experience. Purely evaluative interpretations of blame fail to explain the special significance that blame has, both for those who blame and for those who are blamed. Blaming someone isn't just a matter of assigning them a low moral grade. It's more personal. Assessing the moral character of an agent on the basis of an action is something that anybody can do, no matter far, how far or near they are from the agent itself. But even if others can blame a wrongdoer, blaming is something that the victim of an action is in a position to do in a way that others cannot. And this isn't captured by the uh, purely evaluative uh, notion. Nor does that notion capture the weight and significance of blame. In order to capture that weight, to make blame seem more serious and forceful, it's, it's tempting to move to what I call the punitive interpretation. That is, to see blame as some kind of unpleasant or harsh treatment, which serves as an informal punishment. But this idea doesn't fit with our experience either, I think. We may sometimes blame people, that is, criticize them or complain to them about what they've done, uh, in hopes of changing their behavior. But I don't think this is our main reason. Uh, for, uh, for attaching importance to blame. When we blame others, we're not mainly serving as enforcers of morality. Moreover, this account presupposes that blame is something we have reason to dislike. It's a kind of unwelcome thing. But by itself, the punitive account offers no ex explanation of why this should be so. What is it about the content of blame that explains its unpleasantness and the reason people want to avoid it? It also fails to explain the personal aspect of blame that I mentioned, that is, the, the way in which the victim is in a special position to blame the agent. We can all help to uphold moral sanctions, standards, sorry, perhaps, by scolding, chastising, or shunning wrongdoers. And it may be that chastisement by the victim of an action is particularly effective because it makes or should make the agent feel particularly bad. But this special deterrent efficacy, if it exists, doesn't seem to be what is special about the content of blame, whether it's done by the, when it's done by the victim. So I'll offer an alternative explanation, according to which blame is more than an evaluation, yet not a sanction. I'll then draw some implications from this account for what I'll call the ethics of blame. That is, some conclusions about who has standing to blame and why we should blame. Why blaming is not an attitude that we do better simply to avoid. Tomorrow I'll give a lecture to the philosophy department where I'll take up the further question of the kind of freedom that's required as a precondition for blame, whether people are properly blamed only for things that are the exercise of free will, and whether, on this account, people can be properly blamed for characteristics over which they have no control. Uh, just to let you know what a harsh fellow I am, I'll say that I, in advance, that I give a positive answer to the last question. People can be blamed for things over which they have no control. I'm Pretty nasty. Okay. So what is blame? Well, to start with, in most cases, to decide that what a person has done is blameworthy is in part to decide that the person has behaved wrongly, that he's acted in a way that's contrary to standards that we all have reason to regard as important and normally uh, settling in the matter of what we should do. But wrongness and blame are independent and can come apart. It makes sense to say I agree that he acted wrongly, but you shouldn't blame him. Uh, the blameworthiness of an action depends in ways that the wrongness of the action does not 
on the reasons for which a person acted and the conditions under which he or she did so. For example, it could be appropriate to say, yes, what she did was certainly wrong, but don't blame her, she was under great stress, or you shouldn't blame him, he thought he was acting for the best. Good intentions and conditions such as stress and strain can be relevant to blame even when they're not relevant to the rightness and wrongness of what the person did. It can also make sense, I think, to blame a person even when what he did was not impermissible. For example, it may be appropriate to blame someone who did what was in fact the right thing if he or she did it for extremely nasty reasons. Briefly put, my proposal is this. To claim that a person is blameworthy for an action is to claim that that action shows something about the agent's attitudes toward others that impair the relations that they can have with him or her. To blame a person is to judge him or her to be blameworthy and to take your relation with him or her to be modified by this in a way that the judgment of impaired relations holds to be appropriate. To explain this view, I need to say more about what I mean by someone's relations with others and, by what, and, and about what it is for these relations to be impaired. Here it will help to begin with an analogy between the requirements of morality and the standards that govern more personal relationships, such as those between friends. Suppose I learned that at a party last week, some acquaintances were talking about me and making some rather cruel jokes at my expense. I further learned that my close friend Joe was at the party, and rather than coming to my defense or adopting an attitude of stony silence, he was laughing heartily and even contributed a few well-chosen barbs. This raises a question about what my relationship with Joe really is. Uh, should I re really consider him to be my friend? This isn't just a question about his future conduct. It may be that circumstances like those prevailing at the party the particular combustible mix of personal and chemical influences, is very unlikely to recur. And it may be that Joe feels very bad about the way he behaved, and this also indicates that his conduct is unlikely to be repeated. But the question I ask is not just a question about how he will act in the future, it's a question about what happened in the past and what it indicates about Joe's attitude toward me and the nature of our relationship. There are three ways in which I might respond to something like what Joe has done. First, I might reach a conclusion about the answer to the question I just mentioned. Should I continue to think of him as a friend? An answer to this question is a judgment about the meaning of his action, about what that action shows about his attitudes toward me, considered in relation to the requirements of friendship. Second, I might revise my attitudes toward Joe in the way that this judgment about the meaning of our friendship and the meaning of his action holds to be appropriate. I might stop valuing spending time with him in the way that one does with a friend. I might revise my intentions to confide in him and my intentions to encourage him to confide in me. These things have a different meaning when I learn how he treats me. Third, I might complain to Joe about his conduct, demand an explanation or justification, or indicate in some other way that I no longer see him in the same way that I used to. These three forms of response are closely linked, but there is a degree of independence between them. In order to understand blame in general, it's important to distinguish responses of these three kinds, and in particular, not simply to identify blame with the response of the third kind, where I remonstrate or complain. The conclusion that someone is blameworthy for something that she has done is a response of the first kind, a judgment about what the action shows about the person's attitudes, and, and a conclusion that they are such as to impair his or her relations with others. To actually blame the person is to hold the attitudes toward him or her that this judgment of impairment makes appropriate. Among these attitudes that may be appropriate are intentions to complain, to demand an explanation, a justification, or an apology, but these not, may, may not be present in every instance. I can decide to think differently of him without actually saying anything to him at all. Now, to explain and defend this idea, I need to say more about the idea of a relationship and impairment, um, so let me, let me develop this analogy a little bit further. A relationship, in the very general sense that I'm understanding that term, uh, is constituted by attitudes and dispositions. Central among these are intentions about how the parties will act toward one another, and expectations about how the other will act in return. But relationships also include 
expectations and intentions about the feelings that the parties will have and the considerations that they are disposed to respond to and see as reasons. To be friends with a person involves such things as intending to give help and support when needed over and above what one would do for just anyone, intending to confide in the person and to keep his or her confidences in return, and intending to spend time with the person when one can and to, as they say, keep in touch. Being a friend involves actually being disposed to act in these ways, not just having an abstract intention. It also involves being disposed to do these things for the right kind of reasons, not just out of a sense of obligation or out of a certain kind of concern, but, but out of a certain kind of concern and affection for one another. In addition to these intentions and dispositions to behave in certain ways, to fulfill what might be called the obligations of friendship, being a friend involves being disposed to take pleasure in the friend's company, to hope that things go well for the friend, and to take pleasure in their doing so. A friend isn't obligated to have such hopes and feelings, but a person who failed to have them would be deficient as a friend. If a friend is under consideration for a good job or has bought a lottery ticket, it would be disloyal not to hope that they get the job or win the prize. To hope that these things happen, or even see oneself as a friend as having a reason to hope that they will happen, need not involve believing that there is more reason for one's friend to get the job or win the prize than for anyone else to do so. One hopes for and has reason to hope for these things simply because the person is one's friend. What one has good reason of this kind to hope for need not be based on what one judges to be the best thing overall to have happen. Now what I've been describing is, you might say, the normative ideal of friendship, which specifies what must be true in order for individuals to be friends and specifies the attitudes that friends should ideally have toward one another. It, it thus sets the standards relative to which particular relationships of friendship exist and the higher standards relative to which such relationships can be better or worse. Impairment of a relationship of the kind I'm concerned with occurs when one party, while standing in the relevant relation to another, holds attitudes toward the person that are ruled out by the standards that define a relationship of that kind, thus making it appropriate for the other party to have attitudes other than those that the relationship would normally involve. Blaming someone, as I've said, holding the non-standard attitudes that such judgments take to be appropriate, is thus what Strawson called a reactive attitude, but in a somewhat more general sense than he used the term. That is to say, it's an attitude that we hold in response to what we take to be the attitudes of another person. In this respect, my view is very much like the, the view expressed by Strawson in his famous paper, Freedom and Resentment, and a similar view expressed by Jay Wallace in, 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 in his book. Um, but my view is like Strawson's in seeing blame as grounded in personal relations. Where it differs is in its emphasis on attitudes such as intention and expectation, rather than moral emotions such as resentment and indignation, which are in the forefront of Strawson's discussion. To modify one's expectations and intentions toward a person in the way I've described, in response to what we take to be that person's deficient attitudes, to conclude that one can no longer interact with a person as a friend, is to blame the person in the sense that I have in mind whether or not one also feels resentful toward him or indignant. One might just feel sad. I've been concentrating so far on the point of view of the person whose relationship with another is impaired by what the other person does, by the attitudes that that actions reflect. And I've been considering the attitudes and intentions that this impairment might make appropriate for the person in that position, the position of a victim, you might say. But we should also consider responses that are appropriate for a third party who's not a participant in this relationship. The difference between these two perspectives lies in the meaning that the agent's deficiencies have for these different parties. Like the injured party, a third party can disapprove of the guilty party and judge that this person is, as we might say, not really a very good friend. But only the victim of the action can feel betrayed. Moreover, feeling betrayed isn't just having a certain emotion, a special kind of resentment perhaps. It also involves seeing what the friend has done as raising questions about what one's relation with that person really comes to and about the meaning of our interactions and about how we can go on together or can't. These questions don't arise in the same way for a third party who can disapprove of the way this person treats his friend. So, 
To summarize what we've said so far, this discussion of friendship and blame has brought out five elements central to the account of blame that I'm offering. First, the ground relationship, in this case friendship, which provides the standards relative to which the attitude reflected in an agent's action uh, can be assessed and relative to which they, what they might reveal is an impairment. These standards also determine the appropriateness of various responses. Second, the impairment of a particular relationship, which occurs when attitudes deviate from the ideal specified in the, in the, in the normative idea of the ground relationship. Third, the position of the responder, the person doing the blaming, that is, where this person stands relative to the agent and to the impairment. As I've said, the responder, the person who is blaming in some way or other, might be a friend who was betrayed, a friend of that friend, or a disinterested third party. All these people could blame the malfeasor, but what that would amount to in their different cases is different because they stand in different relations uh, to the person involved. Finally, there, I distinguished what I call the significance of the impairment for the responder. The, what, what the fact that this person's relations with somebody are impaired has much more significance for the person, that is the, the friend, than for somebody else. So the significance of an impairment is a function, one, of the impairment, it's, it's standing relative to the standards of the relationship, and on the other hand, the, responser, the responder's particular, particular position relative to that relationship. Finally, fifth, there's some response that's appropriate. And what response is appropriate will depend upon the impairment, will depend on its significance for the responder given his or her particular, particular position. Now in the case of friendship, it's relatively clear what we're talking about when we refer to the ground relationship. We all understand what friendship is and have some generally shared idea about what it requires. But in the general moral case that is my real subject today, it's much less clear what relationship we might be talking about when we say, as I propose to say, that to blame a person is to conclude that his relations with others have been impaired by the attitudes reflected in his action. Do we really have a relationship with every total stranger whom it makes sense to blame? My answer is that in a general sense, we do, but this requires further explanation. The license plates of the state of Pennsylvania used to say, have a, you have a friend in Pennsylvania, right? I once thought that the license plates of California might say, have a relationship in California. So I'm glad that it's in California that I'm giving this lecture. I feel I may have a more sympathetic uh, audience. That's right. Um, the idea that we have a relationship with everyone in the world sounds odd for at least two reasons. The first is that we naturally take the term relationship to refer to a particular relationship, like the friendship between you and me, right, between two particular people which exists in virtue of the special attitudes that those people have toward one another. Morality is not a relationship in this sense. Rather, it's a normative idea. It's like the normative idea of friendship, which specifies attitudes and expectations that we should have regarding one another when certain conditions are fulfilled. In the case of friendship and most other personal relations, these conditions involve the party's actual attitudes. And it is in virtue of these actual attitudes that their relationship exists, that they are friends. The standards of friendship wouldn't apply to you unless you already were friends, unless you already had the attitudes, feelings, and so on that get you into the, get you into the game of friendship. In the case of morality, however, the conditions in virtue of which it applies, the conditions in virtue of which its standards seem to have a grip on us, at least as I would think, don't concern the party's pre-existing attitudes toward one another. Rather, it's enough that certain general facts be true about them, namely that they are beings of the kind that are capable of understanding and responding to reasons and having their behavior governed by these reasons. Insofar as one supposes that any relationship must, like friendship, be constituted by the party's attitudes, this would provide a second reason for thinking it inappropriate to say that morality specifies requirements that apply to people in virtue of their standing in a certain relationship. But this would be a mistake, I think. The conditions in virtue of which relationships exist and the relevant normative standards there, thereby apply to the parties do not always involve the parties' attitudes toward one another. The relationship of parents to their children is one leading example to the contrary. 
Normative standards requiring care and concern for one's children apply simply in virtue of the fact that they are one's children and one has undertaken to take care of them. One needn't have an intention to do so. One is blameworthy for not having, for not having that intention if one, if one does not. Similarly, in my view, morality requires that we hold certain attitudes toward one another simply in virtue of the fact that we stand in the relation of fellow human beings. It requires us to take, this, this relationship requires us to take care not to behave in ways that will harm the others to whom we are so related. Take care to help them when we are, can easily do so, not lie to them or mislead them, and so on. A morally good person will have standing intentions to regulate his or her behavior toward people in general in these ways, not just toward some particular group. The intention, these intentions concern our behavior, as I said, toward people in general, not just the specific individuals whom we are aware of or could name or recognize if we saw them on the street. These attitudes and intentions concern our behavior toward people, whoever they are, who happen to stand in particular relations to us, that is, the people who might be injured by what we do, whoever they are, or the people who ask us for directions, or the people who need our help in other ways. Beyond these intentions, that is, to regulate our behavior toward people in general in ways that take, a certain, uh, take into account in certain ways their needs and vulnerabilities, good moral relations with others involve being disposed to have other attitudes. They involve being disposed in general to be pleased when we hear of things going well for other people, even strangers. There'd be something wrong if I always took pleasure every time I heard something bad happening to some stranger. There'd be something perverse about that. Um, it's a moral deficiency not to have feelings of this kind toward people we come in contact with, even if they're not our friends, or to hope that things go badly for them and to be pleased when they do. These attitudes and dispositions define what I'm calling the moral relationship of mutual concern, which, I say, ideally we have toward all rational beings. To judge a person to be blameworthy, I'm claiming, is to judge his, that his conduct shows something about him that indicates this kind of, a, a, an impairment of this relation with others, an impairment which makes it appropriate for others to have attitudes toward that person different from those that constitute the normal default relationship of morality. That's what blameworthiness is. To blame someone, on the other hand, is actually to hold modified attitudes of this kind. It's relatively easy to say what constitutes such an impairment. Such an impairment occurs when the person governs him or herself in a way that shows a lack of concern with, as I would say, the justifiability of his or her actions to others, or shows an indifference to considerations that justifiable standards would require us to attend to, such as risk and danger. What's more difficult however, is to describe the kind of response on the part of others that an impairment of this relationship makes appropriate. This is where blame comes in. In the case of friendship, if a person lacks the attitudes required to be a friend, then in the extreme case, this makes it appropriate not to regard him, him or her as a friend at all anymore, to abandon or not to form the intentions and attitudes toward him that friendship involves. In less extreme cases, a friend's deficiencies make it appropriate to qualify these intentions and attitudes, perhaps withholding some of them. The first of these responses, the wholesale dismissal of, of the relationship, of friendship, is not a possibility, I think, in the moral case. Ideally, we would like the moral relationship in which we stand to everyone to be mutual. This relationship is fully realized when we, on want to act in a way that is justifiable to others, and this concern is also reciprocated by them. They want to act in a way that's justifiable to us. But basic moral concern is not conditional upon this mutuality. Even a person who cares not at all about the justifiability of his or her actions to others is still someone to whom justification is owed, in my view. It doesn't follow from this that everybody has to be treated in the same way. All that follows is that differences in treatment must be justifiable within morality so understood. The deficiencies in others, or ourselves, that are, impair our moral relationships with each other may justify some modification or some partial suspension of more specific moral attitudes and intentions toward them. But what modifications or 
suspensions might these be? Right. People aren't completely ruled out of morality by their faults the way they might be written off as non-friends. So what space is there is there left for modifying our intentions with, with respect to them in the way that I think blame involves? Now one view, which might be called moral retributivism, rejects the, the limits that I just mentioned. It holds that when people's moral deficiencies are great, the proper response on our part is to see even their most basic moral claims on the rest of us as limited and qualified. On this view, even our intentions not to kill or harm others are appropriately suspended toward those who fail to manifest these intentions toward others. As I've said, something analogous to this seems to be correct in the case of friendship and other special personal relationships. But in the case of the moral relationship, this view seems to me substantively mistaken. Even those who have no regard for the justifiability of their actions toward others retain their basic moral rights. They still have claims on us not to be hurt or killed, to be helped when they are in dire need, and to have us honor the promises we've made to them. Special circumstances, such as self-defense, may justify abrogating some of these claims, but moral deficiencies by themselves don't justify their completely general suspension. This poses a, a problem for the view of blame that I'm advocating. If, if neither the basic concern with justifiability to a person, nor the intention to respect that person's most basic substantive moral claims can be modified by the person's deficiencies as a participant in moral relations, what room is there for blame as I am describing it? What room is there for any modification on our part of the intentions, dispositions, and expectations that the moral relationship normally involves? One possibility is to find room for this modification simply in the realm of the moral emotions or similar attitudes. According to a view of this kind, what moral deficiencies make appropriate is just moral disapproval, as I said earlier, a kind of grading, or perhaps it makes appropriate more specific moral emotions in the way that Strawson said, such as resentment and indignation. Now, I don't deny that these attitudinal responses, evaluative or reactive, can be appropriate, and they may be one element of blame. But I think an account of blame that focused only on these attitudinal and emotional elements would be too thin. Blame also involves other modifications of our attitudes toward a person including changes in our readiness to interact with him or her in specified ways. And there is a range of interactions with others that are morally important, important because they depend upon and are the precondition for other moral relations, but are at the same time not owed unconditionally to everyone. If a person has no regard for the justifiability of her actions to others, or if, despite professing such a concern, consistently sees things in such a way that gives no weight uh, to anybody else's interests other than her own, then it's quite appropriate to refuse to make agreements with her or to enter into other specific relations that involve trust and reliance. In addition, friendship and other specific relationships of the kind I've been discussing presuppose adequate moral relations of this kind. So deficiencies that impair these moral relations also impair or rule out these more specific forms of interaction. Blame, therefore, centrally involves a suspension in varying degrees and in varying ways of one's readiness to enter into these more specific forms of relationship, and suspension also of the friendly attitudes that signify a readiness to do so. There is also, I think, room for modification in our intention to help others in some ways. Some duties to aid are unconditional. Even murderers and rapists have a claim on us to be rescued when they're drowning or are in danger of bleeding to death from an accident. But normal moral relations also involve a general intention to help others with their projects when this can be done at relatively little cost. And I think we need not have this intention toward those who have shown a complete lack of concern for the interests of others. It would be wrong of us to go out of the way to kick over their sandcastles, so to speak, but we don't have to offer them our shovels. Impairment of a person's moral relations with others can also make it appropriate to suspend the dispositions to certain feelings that I mentioned above as part of the normal moral relationship. The fact that a person has behaved very badly toward you or toward others can make it appropriate 
not to take pleasure in that person's successes, or maybe make it, it may make it impossible to take pleasure in the person's successes, and, and make it appropriate or not even possible to hope that things will go well for him. To lack the disposition to these hopes and feelings in regard to a person, however, is not the same thing as judging it to be good that things should go bad for, badly for him or her. It's not the same thing as judging that it should, would be bad, not be good, that they go well. As I said earlier, hoping for something or taking pleasure in it, in the way we hope that our friend will win the lottery and take pleasure in his doing so, is not the same thing as judging it to be a good thing, as it were, from the point of view of the universe, uh, that these things should happen. It's, a, it's no better a thing that our friend should win the lottery than someone else does. But we would be a deficient friend if we didn't hope that they won. Similarly, in the abstract case, uh, we don't have to think that it would be a good thing that malefactors should suffer, but if people have behaved very badly, we don't have to hope uh, that they win the lottery, so to speak. We don't have to take pleasure in their successes. And maybe, as I said, we can't do that. I think the failure to draw this distinction between what one has reason to hope for on the one hand and what one judges to be good on the other can lead one mistakenly to take the appropriateness of suspending these dispositions to hope as evidence for a desert-based retributivism, according to which it is held to be a good thing that those who do wrong should suffer something bad as a result. We should bear in mind here the distinction I've drawn between blameworthiness on the one hand and blame on the other. To claim that a person is blameworthy for an action, I've said, is to claim that this action indicates something about the agent's attitudes which impairs others' relations with him. To blame someone, on the other hand, is to actually hold attitudes toward him which differ in the ways that reflect this impairment. Uh, differ, that is to say, from the attitudes typical of the relationship in which one would otherwise stand to that person. A judgment of blameworthiness is a neutral, position-independent judgment that anyone can make, however distant or close he or she may be from the relevant agent and action. As I pointed out earlier, however, the content of blame, as opposed to blameworthiness, the content of blame depends very much on the significance for the person doing the blaming of the particular agents and, and the, the uh, faults re that, are, that are manifested in what the agent has done. Blame has the most substantial content for people who interact with the agent in some specific way, as friends or family members or neighbors or co-workers or fellow citizens. This is so because they are, they are the ones most likely to be affected by the impairment in question and the action that expressed it, but also because they are the ones who need to decide, since they interact with the person, what intentions they should have with regard to their future interactions, how they should understand their relations, and what meaning they should assign to them. Things are very different with respect to the behavior of someone who lived long ago and has no contact with us and no effect on our lives. We can still judge such, such a person to be blameworthy. And this judgment, to judge this, is to judge that those who actually interacted with that person had good reason to withdraw their intentions to trust him or rely upon him, for example. But there's no point in our forming such intentions ourselves. I didn't have to trust Julius Caesar. So I can say he was blameworthy, but I, I can't revise my intentions about how I'm going to interact with him. Our own attitude uh, toward a person uh, toward a person who's that distant from us, like Julius Caesar, thus fades into a kind of generalized disapproval. And even disapproval can come to seem like a kind of pointless grading, unless we have some particular reason to be concerned with the person in question. Perhaps in the case of a great historical figure like Julius Caesar, we do. He's part of the story of history. So the question of whether he was a, a good guy or a bad guy uh, maybe is part of that story. But we need, we need, we need, it's not pointless to think, to think about that question. But we have no occasion, as it were, to regard, to, to, or very little occasion to regard our intentions, to, to revise our intentions about him. So blameworthiness is possible across all these different points of view. Blame varies a great deal in how much content and significance it has. Maybe it doesn't go away altogether, but it, but, but it takes on a, a different and diminished uh, content with respect to people uh, who are very distant from us. Now, in this last part of my paper, you'll be glad to hear that there's, there's hope. Um, uh, the end is in sight. Uh, I, I want to draw some conclusions about the general account I've 
a, a blame that I've offered for what I call, and this is the title of the, of the, of the lecture, the ethics of blame. That is, say, for the, the standards that govern our decisions whether it's blame, whether it's appropriate, and whether it's not. And I think one advantage of the relationship-based account that I've offered is that it can give, I think, a better explanation of these standards, better explanation of this kind of ethics uh, than alternative evaluative or punitive uh, interpretations. Consider first cases in which a person is open to moral criticism for blaming someone. It's obviously objectionable, I think, to blame someone unfairly, that is to say, on insufficient grounds. And it seems true to say more generally that one should not be too quick to blame others, but should instead show what Kant called a generosity of spirit and be understanding and forgiving. Some people would go further and say that blame is a moralistic and excessively judgmental attitude, which it would be morally better to avoid altogether. Perhaps avoiding it altogether is too saintly, more than most of us can manage, but on this view, it would be better to avoid it if we could. There is something, there is something disreputable, you might say, about blame. When I sit next to someone on the airplane, it's already embarrassing when they ask me what I do to have to admit that I'm a philosopher. But if they ask me what I'm working on, and I say, well, the last couple of years I've been thinking about blame, you know, they really start e edging away from me on the seat. There, so, so it's not, <laughs> there's, something, there's something unsavory about it. Now, this, this idea that, that blame is an unsavory attitude, which we ought to rise above if only we, we, we could do it, uh, I think draws some of its plausibility from the idea that I mentioned earlier that blaming is a matter of judging other people, of giving them low moral grades. And understood in this way, uh, blaming is unattractive because it in, seems to involve adopting a position of superiority as the moral judge of other people. But I think blame does not have this character when it's understood in the way I'm proposing. On the account I'm offering, blame requires a moral judgment, but it's not a matter of grading. It involves adopting attitudes toward a person that one takes to be called for by the significance that that person's action has for our relationships with him or her. Since these relationships, friendship, cooperation, citizenship, being fellow co-workers and so on, neighbors even, since these relationships are in most cases symmetrical relations between equals, Blame involves no claim of superiority. Rather, it is, as I've said, made from within relationships that are relationships between equals and I think can even be required by this relationship of equality. Even when it's understood in this way, however, blame may still seem to have a disagreeable aspect. It's too much like nursing a grudge. And again, better to be something that one could avoid if one could. But you know, to give the devil his due, uh, I still think that even this is a mistake. Blame can be carried to excess, but the complete rejection of blame would, I think, rule out important relations with others. And this rejection itself, I think, is likely to involve objectionable attitudes of superiority or inferiority. The complete rejection of blame would either involve denying that the other person's actions can have a meaning that would impair one's relationship with him or her, or else denying that when this happens, some adjustment in our own attitudes is made appropriate. The former denial, that the person's actions can have the meaning uh, that I mentioned, involves an attitude of superiority toward the person in question, something like the attitude of a parent toward a very young child. You don't want to take seriously what they, what they, what they say or what their, what their actions indicate. It therefore represents a failure to take the person seriously as a, as a participant in moral or other relationships. The second kind of denial, denial that, that their faults uh, call for any revision in behavior on your part, involves, I think, accepting an attitude of inferiority toward oneself that in extreme cases is demeaning. I don't really have standing to complain. However he treats me, I just have to go on treating him the same uh, as I was before. Cases of this second kind, that is, cases where failure to blame involves a demeaning attitude toward yourself, are instances of a broader class of cases in which failing to blame an agent for an action impairs one's relations with the victim of that action. What's special about these cases is that the victim is you. But let's take the third person case. Suppose that Powers, the agent, has done something terrible to Vic Vincent, the victim. If you know this, and if you understand what a terrible thing it was, 
then your relationship with victim, Vincent is impaired if you don't blame powers. That is to say, if your intentions and expectations with regard to powers remain unchanged, if they remain those you'd have toward any respectable member of your moral community, then that impairs your relations with Vincent. It's not enough just to acknowledge that what Powers did was wrong. Given what he did to Vincent, you can't have unimpaired moral relationships with both of them at the same time. Failures to blame that involve deny, uh, a, a denial of, 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 this, uh, of this case are thus, the denial of, of one standing to blame are thus a special case, as I said, a special case in which you are the victim. So as it were, your relationship with yourself is impaired by your failure to blame the agent. Now, not only blame, but also some public expression of blame seems to many people to be called for in say, cases of serious crime, such as mass murder or gross violation of human rights. The victims of such crimes and their families, you know, the, the, the Madres de Plaza de Mayo in, 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 in Argentina, for example, object extremely strongly when the perpetrators of these crimes, the people who cause their family members to disappear and so on, are not punished and even continue to be treated as perfectly ordinary members of society. Their claim, I think, is not just that it is appropriate to feel indignation and resentment toward people, and not just that it's appropriate that these people should be made to suffer, although I think some victims also want this, of course. The point is also that there's something inappropriate about being asked to treat these people as respectable fellow citizens, and something inappropriate about being asked to accept other people's treating them in that way. I think the relationship account of blame can explain how blame, how, how, how the wrongness can create, as it were, an obligation to blame, not only on the part of the victim, but also on the part of third parties. I've been considering the ways in which proper relations with agents or victims can rule out the wholesale exclusion of blame, contrary to what one might have thought. But there are also cases, I think, in which our relations with agents count against blaming them or require one to qualify or modify blame. I've already mentioned one such case, that of, well, I think maybe I edited it out trying to make this a little shorter, that of parents and their adult children. Even when parents must admit that what their grown son or daughter has done is blameworthy, it may be appropriate for them as parents to continue offer, to offer sympathy and the right kind of encouragement, to continue to look for the best in their offspring and be willing to trust them by offering a second chance. These attitudes can be required of good parents toward their son or daughter, even if strangers could properly regard the son or daughter as someone not to be associated with at all. Now there is, of course, such a thing as being too willing to overlook the faults of one's offspring, as well as being insufficiently willing to do so. And victims can reasonably ask parents to acknowledge the legitimacy of their claims against their children. The blameworthiness, and, sorry, and to acknowledge the blameworthiness of what their offspring had, have done. Blameworthiness, as I've said, is a neutral judgment that anybody can be asked to enter into, as opposed to blame, which is a more active form of interaction. <laughs> But victims can't reasonably ask parents, I think, to distance themselves from their offspring in the way that other strangers could be expected to do. So the incompatibility between normal relations with perpetrators and normal relations with their victims, which I mentioned when I was discussing Powers and Vincent, is modified when the person being asked to blame is a parent of the wrongdoer. These phenomena, cases in which willingness to blame can be inhibited by loyalty, and failures to blame can themselves be blameworthy, arise frequently in politics. So let me turn to some political examples. Political leaders and those who speak for political parties and other groups are often unwilling to condemn wrongful actions by their compatriots or members of their own party or ethnic group. If they, if they are quite ready to blame others outside their group for similar wrongs, this refusal to blame might be criticized simply as inconsistent or hypocritical, a double standard. But I think it's also objectionable in another way. Unlike the relation between parent and child, the relation between members of a political party does not provide good reason for qualifying blame. Members of a party may have reasons of group pride or political calculation 
for maintaining solidarity and refusing to blame or break with the members of their group who have committed crimes. But these justifications, unlike the claims of parental loyalty, are ones that the victims of these crimes have no reason to accept. Refusing to blame in these cases is therefore incompatible with a normal moral relationship with these victims. That is to say, the refusal to blame one's compatriots or one's fellow party members in this case is blameworthy. It impairs your relations with the victims. Although in some cases it may be a shrewd but cynical uh, political tactic. The blameworthiness that, I'm, that I say is involved in these cases, the blameworthiness of failing, failing to blame your, the members of your party for what they've done to, to outsiders, is not a form of collective guilt, although it might be confused with guilt. The point is not that those who refuse to condemn crimes committed by members of their group thereby share the guilt for those crimes. It's rather that their relationships with the victims are impaired in a related but different way, a lesser way, lesser because a willingness to do unjustifiable things is a more serious impairment of, of one's relations with the victim than an unwillingness to condemn members of one's own group for doing such things. I turn now from the question of who must blame and who is blameworthy for not blaming to the question of who has standing to blame who may blame. On the view I'm defending, a judgment of blameworthiness, as I've said, is an impersonal one, one that anyone can make whatever his or her relation to the agent in question may be. By contrast, blame is more personal because it involves taking the view that that person's attitudes, usually the attitudes revealed in an action, impair one's relations with that person. So the content of blame varies depending on what those relations are. The fact that blame depends on relationships in this way explains, I think, how a person's standing to blame can be undermined. This is clearest in cases in which the person who would do the blaming has in the past treated the person who is to be blamed in ways that are as bad as what the person is being blamed for. Take a mild example. Suppose we're friends, and I'm often extremely late for our appointments for no good reason. And sometimes I fail to show up at all without giving you any warning. But suppose now that on some occasion you fail to appear for our appointment and I complain indignantly, saying that friends ought not to treat each other that way. What I'm saying is probably quite true, but I'm not in a position to make the complaint. It's not, I think, just that I am being inconsistent by applying to you a standard that I don't apply to myself, or that I'm being hypocritical in applying to you a standard that my own conduct shows that I don't really accept. These things may be true. I may be inconsistent or, and hypocritical. Um, but there's also a further problem. The problem is that I can't claim that the attitudes revealed in your willingness to stand me up constitute an impairment in our relations. I can't, I, I can't claim this because the mutual expectations and intentions that constitute these relations were already impaired by my own similar attitudes revealed repeatedly in my past conduct. I can't, you know, sorry, I'm shocked, shocked to go that this kind of, no, to hear that this kind of thing is going on, right? I don't have standing to do that when I myself have already uh, been mucking about in, in the same way. Now, things would be changed, but only slightly, I think, if when blaming you, I at the same time said quite sincerely that I was wrong to have behaved in this way in the past. This would eliminate the inconsistency in my current judgments. But by itself, I think, it would not restore my standing to blame you. If anything can do that, it would have to involve something beyond just blaming myself. Something such as, at a minimum, giving convincing evidence that I recognize my faults and have a sincere intention to behave differently in the future. A person's standing to blame can also be undermined not only by what that person has done to the person who is to be blamed, but also by what that person has done to third parties. Suppose that you've injured others by lying to them and stealing from them. If I'm also guilty of lying and stealing, this undermines my ability to blame you for your similar actions. As before, we might explain this by saying that it would be inconsistent or hypocritical of me to blame you when I do the same thing myself. But as I said earlier, I think something more is involved. In blaming you, 
I would be holding that your willingness to behave in this way toward other people makes you someone toward whom I cannot have the intentions and expectations that constitute the normal moral relationship. Blameworthiness just talks about how what you do impairs your relations with others. Blaming you is a matter of saying, I've got to think differently about what our relationship uh, actually, actually is. Um, but insofar as these, um, yeah, but in, but insofar as these normal expectations and intentions are mutual, my own contact already conduct already reveals me to be a person who can't be a participant in these relations. I can't be trusted in exactly the same way that you can't be trusted. So there's some further element of falsehood in my suggesting that it is your willingness to act in these ways that indicates an untrustworthiness which impairs our relationship with each other. Jerry Cohen, uh, the Oxford uh, philosopher and political theorist, uh, in an interesting article about terrorism, has identified several other ways in which a person's standing to blame can be undermined. He observes that if you have told me to do something, ordered me to do it, or knowingly facilitated my doing it, then although you can correctly say that what I do is wrong and blameworthy, you can't blame, worth, you can't blame me for it. What he says is actually you can't criticize me for it, but I think it holds a blame in the sense that I'm using that term. This can be explained in the same way as the cases I've just discussed. Your involvement in what I've done, that you ordered me to do it or facilitated my doing it, indicates a willingness to countenance that kind of thing, the kind of thing that I did. Therefore, you can't say that what stands in the way of your having possible moral relations with me is just my willingness to countenance such actions. Since these relations are symmetrical, again, your own willingness is just as much of an impairment in our relations as mine would be. Cohen also discusses a slightly different and more controversial class of cases in which one person does something unjustifiable partly because another person has wrongfully deprived him of legitimate means for pursuing the same important goals. Even if being deprived of these alternatives does not justify what the first person does, it nonetheless bars the second person from blaming him for it. Suppose, for example, that you keep interrupting my meetings in order to force me to consider some complaint or proposal that you want me to consider. I may object to this behavior quite correctly, on the general ground that it's inappropriate with the appropriate relations between us. We ought, you might say, to deal with such matters in a civil way through presentation of reasons rather than by attempts at intimidation of the sort you're engaging in. I might be quite correct in saying this, even if it's also true that I wrongfully refused to consider your case when you presented it in a civil manner. If I did, however, then I can't blame you for your behavior, even if I'm correct that it is blameworthy. This is because I can't claim that it is simply your attitudes, your lack of civility, that impairs our relations with each other. What you did is wrong, what you did is blameworthy, but I can't blame you because I can't say that you're the one that's, uh, that's spoiling what is between us. Cohen suggests, in perhaps the most controversial part of his article, article, that this idea explains why some government officials may lack standing to condemn terrorists. Even if what terrorists do is unjustifiable, he says, despite the, perhaps the legitimacy of their political goals, it may nonetheless be true that government officials lack standing to condemn these illegitimate actions if their governments have prevented the terrorists from pursuing their legitimate goals by legitimate means. What the, what the terrorists do is wrong, uh, what, they're blameworthy for doing it, but people who have prevented them from doing other, uh, pursuing the goals by legitimate means can't, can't complain. A similar, a similar argument and similar considerations, I think, explain, and here I'm moving toward the ter terrain of the lecture I'll give tomorrow about, about moral responsibility and free will. Uh, similar considerations explain how the fact that a person was treated terribly as a child can modify the way in which we can blame him for the awful things he does as an adult. I don't think that blame in these cases is undermined by the fact that the person had no control over the factors that made him the kind of person that he is. Nor is it undermined, I would say, by the fact that given the kind of person he is, he's incapable of understanding the reasons against acting in the way that he does. 
I'll defend these claims more later. Nonetheless, I think, even if the fact that a person was horribly treated as a child doesn't make it inappropriate to blame him because it absolves him of responsibility, this factor can inter still interact with and limit blame or qualify blame in an important way. The fact that a person was mistreated as a child can change our relationship with him in a way akin to those that Cohen discusses. I think this is a way of understanding a point that Gary Watson makes uh, in a discussion of the, the infamous killer Robert Harris. Harris was unbelievably heartless and brutal. But when we learn how terribly he was treated when he was young, Watson says, here I'm quoting Watson, we are unable to command an overall view of his life that permits the reactive attitudes to be sustained without ambivalence. The sympathy toward the boy that he was is at odds with the outrage toward the man he is. In fact, each of these responses is appropriate, but taken together they do not enable us to respond overall in a coherent way. What's, what Watson says here is, I think, psychologically quite, quite compelling. It seems right. But the question is, what theoretical explanation could you give of what's going on? Um, I think we have one here. As Watson says, the facts about Harris's past do not erase or diminish his blameworthiness. They do not change the fact that he's a heartless killer and someone we should never trust or associate with. It's not just that we feel sympathy for Harris or sympathy for what he was like as a child. It's rather that our revised relationship with him is complicated by the fact that he was so ill-treated. Not by us personally, perhaps, but by what we might call the larger moral community. This affects blame in something like the way that Cohen suggests. It doesn't undermine altogether our standing to blame, but it requires a more complex revision of our attitudes toward him. He is to blame. He's also a victim. That is, we can't say that he was the first person to, to impair his relations with the rest of us. Those relations were already impaired, if not by us personally, at least by society as a whole. And that qualifies, that, that's the factor that qualifies, uh, it seems to me, qualifies blame. Blame, even though it doesn't qualify blameworthiness or wrongness. And I'll continue these, these matters a little bit more tomorrow. But thank you very much for your patience. Thank <laughs> you.